Fantastic, and welcome. I always talk over the recording in progress announcement. So I am thrilled to see so many of you, and I know staying on camera is not always fun, but I love getting to have at least some interaction since we're not in the room. So thanks to folks who are able to do that. Um, we get to spend roughly the next hour, two hours, not hour, talking about positive classroom supports framed within a PBIS framework, and I have the privilege of introducing one of our tools to you. One thing I always forget to do is introduce myself, so I will start there. My name is Brandy Simonson, and by day, I am a professor at the University of Connecticut. I also get to wear two other hats that I love. One is I co-direct the National Center on PBIS. So along with Kent McIntosh and Heather George and Tim Lewis, we love doing the work with all of our states in Michigan is often one of the folks that, one of the states that we call up a lot. And another hat that I wear, and in both roles, I work very closely with Steve Goodman, who I know is a friend to all of you, is I also co-lead the National Integrated MTSS Research Network. So in that work, we're integrating the work of PBIS, and for many of our projects, early literacy. And so the context of classroom makes a ton of sense for both of those, and the CMOD is a tool we've used across all of those projects. So really excited to share. I am, for folks who don't know me, pretty informal, so I will invite you to keep questions coming in chat. I've asked Melissa just to keep eyes on it to interrupt me if I don't see them, because I usually make your faces super big on my screen, so I sometimes lose chat. I'm also totally okay if folks want to come off mute and interrupt with questions, and I'll also pause at certain points for that. So feel free to kind of get cozy, grab coffee, tea, whatever, and we will dive in. So the plan is that in the next couple of hours, we'll talk about the principles that guide Classroom PBIS. For most of you, this will be very much review. We'll talk about how and why, first, we measure Classroom PBIS, then we'll talk about how. And to try and make an assessment tool seem fun, I, I used a clip art icon. I'm 50-50 on whether that's cute or creepy, so you all can give me feedback on whether this is helpful, because it's often peeking in on slides. So I chose it was cute, but you all let me know. So after we talk about why and how we measure, I wanted to just make sure folks were really clear on what the practices look like. And I'm assuming you all came to this training with a pretty deep level of expertise. So this is not likely to be new content for you. But what I've found is when I go in and I'm watching someone else teach and I'm trying to determine if they're doing this practice or not, it's slightly trickier than when I'm just trying to implement it for myself. So throughout all of the content today, for those of you who are going to be in roles of observing, peeking at, supporting classroom practice, keep that role in mind as opposed to the role many of you have likely had in the past where you were the one doing the practice. So ask the questions as you're thinking about the range of classrooms that you're supporting, the range of educators that you're going to be observing. So really think about that as we're diving into practices, because it gives you a different lens within which to ask some questions. And then I will land us in a reminder of the resources that are available. And because you all have so many amazing resources in Michigan, I chose to zoom out and just share a couple of the federal ones that I know you all also use. I would always prioritize your local state resources first, but I just wanted to have, a, have you all be aware of a couple more. All right, so again, for folks who are joining and didn't hear that initial intro, I am really informal. Please unmute, please use chat, stay engaged. And I will also pause specifically to ask for points of engagement. Okay, so diving into the first conversation. So when we think about how we implement in a classroom in the context of PBIS, the principles that guide that practice are the same <laughs> as the principles that guide us everywhere else. So this next conversation should feel very familiar to you. So in all the work that we do within PBIS, we always start with a focus on equity. And we think about equity very broadly, but also very explicitly. So we talk about equity for race and ethnicity, equity based on sexual identity, orientation, gender identity. We talk about equity based on ability, 
and the range of ability statuses kids present with. We talk about equity based on gender and we could go on. So we call out and are very explicit about what equity means in general. And when we get into classrooms, we are very explicit about what equity means in the classroom. So by centering equity, we are being thoughtful about cultural, developmental, contextual adaptations. We're being thoughtful about practices being implemented for all students. We're being thoughtful of ways that we disaggregate data. So it's not just kind of a word. It is actually driving the actions that we do as we get to the classroom. And for me, and I think for most of us, MTSS is our pathway to ensure we're doing that. Because if you think about when we're doing MTSS or PBIS really well, we are building in proactive supports for all students. And for today, we're also going to be really clear that we're doing this for all educators. So what do we need to do to set everybody up for success? We're then using our data to guide where do we need to continue to enhance to ensure tier one is robust enough that many people are successful with just tier one. And if you think about what that means, if you go into a setting that is struggling more, tier one needs to be even more robust to make sure that all students, all educators are experiencing tier one and that the majority of them are successful with only tier one. So tier one is a really big piece of what we're doing. And the CMOT is a tool for capturing some of tier one in the classroom. We also know that not everyone is gonna to respond to tier one alone. So with MTSS, we're using data to guide our decisions about what kinds of targeted or tier two supports and what specific individualized or tier three supports we need. And we're using data to then guide us to match people with the levels of support for each of their unique skill deficits, needs, or strengths. So we're using data to guide all of that conversation. And again, when we do that really well, MTSS then is our tool for equity because we know that we're actually meeting every student's needs. I recently had a conversation with Alexa Posny, who is one of the folks who was kind of at the grounds level of bringing MTSS to the forefront of education. And she provided the clearest definition that I've ever heard of what it is. And she said it was just simply that we are giving every kid what they need when they need it, regardless of anything else, regardless of funding, regardless of label. It was just getting people what they need when they needed it. And for us, again, we're going to think about that for educators. So MTSS then allows us to differentiate supports, monitor, and continue to adjust so that we increase the probability of everyone having a positive, successful experience. To know that we're getting there, we provide ourselves with guideposts. We identify locally meaningful outcomes that we're going to use to judge kind of where we need to go and whether we have achieved those. And as we're thinking about outcomes, even though we're talking about educators today, I always think about that our end goal, regardless of where we're intervening, our end goal is always student growth and benefit. So regardless of the conversation we're having, the line we're drawing is the decisions we're making to the impact on students. So even though we'll talk about kind of looking at classroom practice, the reason we're doing that is to make the lives of kids better, to make the experiences of kids better, to make sure they benefit from those decisions we're making. The practices is what we'll talk a little bit about today, but honestly, they're sometimes the easy part. <laughs> So those are the things we put in place to do with the students. These are evidence-based, culturally relevant. I think the tendency, especially as we've come out or are coming out of the pandemic, is sometimes to do more. So we have some places that are doing a lot more and layering and adding. And I think especially right now, our goal should be to streamline and do a few evidence-based, culturally relevant practices and do them really well. So you'll notice that logic come through the CMOT. There are a few practices that we're going to ask you to focus on with teachers on a regular basis, not because they're all teachers do, but if we did these few things really well, we would see a big benefit for students. So the practices, again, are kind of the easy part, but helping people think about what to do and also what not to do, that's some of the 
kind of bigger picture conversation that we'll have that helps us kind of put practices in the context of the other elements that you all are anticipating, the systems and the data. The other piece that I'll just mention is to be able to do a few things, we have to be really intentional about the integration alignment and connection. So those few practices have to support not just a kid's behavior, but their social emotional skills, their academic skills, kind of all of those other domains. And you all in Michigan have been such a leader in this work. So that probably is already in the back of your heads. So I've mentioned data a bunch of times already, but just to call it out explicitly with this graphic, as you all know, the function of data is to inform all the things. It's to look at screening for who needs what and when. It's to use progress monitoring data to see how well it's going. It's to look at equitable implementation. So our, is our fidelity not just happening well overall, but are each and every kid and teacher experiencing fidelity and outcomes? Are each and every kid and subgroups of people experiencing similar and equitable outcomes? So the data drive our decisions about what to do, how to do it, and how to adjust it over time. The systems, though, is what makes all of this possible, right? It's what allows us as grownups in the context of classrooms to be successful. And so part of those systems is having teaming structures and having a supportive environment that allows this work to feel exciting and invigorating and supported and not punishing or evaluative. So the systems are always critical for everything that we do. They allow us to achieve the outcomes we want. They allow us to sustain and eventually scale across different environments. But in the context of today's conversation, they are critical <laughs> for the data that we're talking about to be used in the way it's intended, which is to support and celebrate teachers, not to evaluate and punish. So continue to think about the systems that go behind everything we talk about today and we'll land there again at the end of the conversation. So I'm guessing that was very familiar to you. This is one of those things that some states call tattoos, some states call refrigerator magnets, but are there any questions or things you all wanna bring up in the conversation before we keep going? I'm gonna get rid of some of the detail and just have us focus on the big picture for a second. And it is okay if not. I like how you mentioned, sorry, no, I just, I, I like how you mentioned um, to just start with a few instead of trying to cover so much and add too many because that gets to be so overwhelming. So I like that's a great idea is to make sure that we um, just get the biggest bang for our buck by using what would work and keep it simple. And I like the uh, equitable quote of every kid what they need when they need it I think that's that's a tattoo <laughs> I never yeah. heard that I mean I never heard that uh, metaphor but yeah that's a tattoo for sure so thank you thank you yeah when she said it I was like of course that's what it is but no one had ever said it quite as simply or clearly so I didn't put it in this presentation but I now have a PowerPoint slide of that because it's like this needs to be what we all focus on and how we think about this work it's even better than a triangle which that's hard to imagine something being better than a triangle, but I think that statement is even better than a triangle. All right, I will keep us going, but if again, if you have observations, comments, questions, please continue to pop those in chat. So there are two key resources nationally, and again, at the end, I will dive us into these a little bit more if we have time. The, they may both look very familiar to you, but we've updated both of them within the last year or so. So if you haven't peeked, the one that focuses on practices that we call our practices guide has a much longer title. It used to be supporting and responding to students' behavior. It is now supporting and responding to, to students' social, emotional, and behavioral needs. And so it is that older document from 2015 brought into our present day with a kind of the focus on practices we've always identified, but we were really intentional about building in stronger connections to equity and relationships and things that especially through the pandemic became very clear needed to be built into our classroom practices. And then more recently, we have updated what used to be two separate guides. There was a data guide and a systems guide, and we combined them. And so these 
two guides really focus on how we do PBIS really intentionally in the classroom. So I will walk you through them in a little bit more detail later, but just wanted you to have them kind of in your back, the back of your mind, because I think they're really helpful and impactful as you do work in teams. They are also overwhelming if you're a brand new teacher. So these are resources for teams. These are not a handout for one person, just to also put that in context. Okay, so the guiding principles for the work we'll talk about today are the same guiding principles for all of the work we do within PBIS and MTSS. And so the next question I'm hoping you all can answer in your heads already. So why is it that we are going to measure specifically implementation in the classroom? So answer in your head, and I'm gonna then give you a little bit of my answer in a few slides. So one answer is we have decades of research, more than half a century of research that has identified and supported specific evidence-based classroom practices. So we have known for a very long time what some of the practices are that work in classrooms. Of course, over that time, we've learned how to do them better. We've learned how to do them in a more culturally nuanced way, but we have a long history of knowing what works. So we also know from kind of more recent decades about how we support these practices. So one way we could maybe should support these practices is through really good preparation programs. The second way that we can support these practices is job embedded professional development once educators get into the workforce. So while we have known for a long time what these practices are and how to get them installed in classrooms, and again, I hope this is not a familiar story to you because I think you all in Michigan have been leaders in this field, but in much of the US and much of the world, we have not done a great job of actually using the science to guide our work. So our pre-service programs often have limited, if any, training in really good evidence-based practice in student social emotional behavioral domains. And I say that as someone who does pre-service training. So I'm throwing myself and all of us under the bus that we have not done a great job as a field in the pre-service piece. The other part is once teachers get into the workforce in a lot of areas in our country and again in the world, we don't provide effective support in this. So teachers are entering the workforce not adequately prepared and then they're getting into the kind of environment and not getting sufficient support. And while I hope this is not a familiar story for you all, it might be for individual educators. And so just helping to remember that just like our kids, we should not assume prior knowledge. We should think about how to set folks up for success, how to provide support, how to train, how to do all the things we would do for an educator, not assuming that they should know better. I will just share personally, my initial certification program, I was initially certified as an elementary oh, educator, training. zero, zero training in supporting kids' social emotional behavioral needs, zero. And thankfully, I wanted to be a special educator and went and got an endorsement at Oregon where I learned about this thing called PBIS that was just starting to be developed. But had I gone out with my initial certification, I would have had zero training. And that is an example that speaks to so many of the educators in our country. So it's not surprising then that in national research, when we look at implementation in classrooms, these practices are often implemented at lower levels than desired. So we often see a gap between what we know would work for kids and what's actually being implemented in practices. And this is, again, not said in the context of blaming anybody other than maybe those of us who are in charge of free service. <laughs> But it is said in the context of when we see these lower implementation levels, it's not blaming the teacher. It is to think about the supports we need to put in place to set them up for success. And we know this is critical because we're experiencing nationally such teacher shortage. And this is not new during the pandemic. This happened before the pandemic. 
but one of the most common reasons teachers leave the field is because of concerns over student behavior. There are other reasons for sure, but this is one of them. And so being able to think about how to support teachers in supporting students is critical, not just for our kids, but for our educators as well. The good news is we know how to do this. So this is the work we all do in PBIS. We know about how to build systems. We know how to train. We know how to coach. So this is work we know how to do. It's also work that until more recently, like within the last five, 10 years, we've often only done in non-classroom settings, kind of in the school-wide focus. So we are being much more intentional about what it looks like to bring the training and coaching into the classroom. And again, that's critical because not only does this improve behavioral outcomes for kids, but it also improves academic outcomes. And you all know from research and from your own experiences that those two are super closely related. So by being able to support students' social emotional behavioral needs, we're supporting their academics and vice versa. And these effective practices are the gears that allow us to do both. They also allow us to think about equitable outcomes. And when we have good practices installed in the classroom, we see that improve for students. We also see that this allows us to better sustain implementation across time. So some of the research that Kent and others have done have shown us that when we get practices installed in classrooms, not only do outcomes improve, but the schools and districts are more likely to sustain implementation over time because teachers have experienced and students have experienced those successes. So all of that is to say, we need data to help guide that decision, all of the decisions in those gears. We need data to guide kind of who needs what support as educators, who needs what adjusted support as students. And all of that allows us to better support student outcomes. So the why for me is because it works. We know the practices that work, we know the systems that work, and we need data to guide our implementation of both practices and systems. Are there other whys or other answers to that question that came up for you that did not show up in those slides? And again, you can throw it in chat, you can unmute, and I won't pause for too long if folks don't have things they want to share, but I'd love to hear from you all. So Brandy, my first reaction was, it's because where kids spend most of their time in the day. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's great if we make the cafeteria and the hallways better, but if we don't actually fix the classrooms, the kids are not experiencing these positive and proactive supports. I, I mean, all of you who are parents also have lived on that side of it, the impact of a full year with a teacher, right? The classroom is so critical. And especially in elementary years, or if your kid is in a self-contained program, one teacher makes such a big difference in that kid's life. And so being able to ensure that those experiences are positive, proactive, and supportive for all kids is so critical. Yeah, and teacher retention is another huge piece. I always think about the, how critical it is that we set teachers up for success when they're first getting into the field, so it's more likely they stay. Because the data on teachers leaving the field within five years it's astronomical. The old data before the pandemic was 50% of teachers would be gone within five years. I haven't, I've seen shortage data, but I haven't seen that statistic updated. It probably is, but the retention piece is huge. Okay. And you all may have more specific and individual wise, but I think we've hit some of the bigger messages. So now it's the how, which is the kind of meat of the conversation for today. So I want to start with a little bit of a disclaimer that our measures in this area are not great. So what we have in the research literature are the gold standard measures for supporting and assessing teachers implementation of classroom behavior management, whatever label folks use for their measure. The gold standard measures are crazy resource intensive, require advanced training and many hours to actually pull off. And so there was a gap in the field to have a more user-friendly, kind of briefer, accessible tool that we could use, because even the gold standard measures were not capturing everything. So where we have landed in our recommendations, because none of the tools are perfect, even the gold standard ones, 
is to have folks think about data much like we do for kids, right? We don't make decisions just based on an office referral or just based on a screener or just based on a whatever. We make decisions based on a kind of series of data. So when we're thinking about observing teachers' classroom practice, one of the ways we used to do it is we would go in and count skill rates. <clears throat> so we would count how often they use specific phrase, how often they use opportunities to respond, how often they, whatever. And what I love about that is it's quantitative. If we have really good definitions, that's an objective way to be able to look at kind of levels of implementation. How many of you have gone in and done an observation that way where you're counting specific practices? Yeah, I think there's a huge benefit to do that. So we're recommending that some level of that stays in the data that you're collecting. So some kind of quantified count. But we also kept having these experiences in our research where we were going in and doing that. And there was one classroom in particular that inspired this tool. Jen Freeman and I were sitting in the classroom, like both counting <laughs> and the rates were low and we both left and we're like, but that's the classroom we would want our kids in. The rates were low <laughs> because we observed like in January or something and the teacher had already taught the skills and prompted the skills and reinforced the skills. And so the teacher's rates were low, but the kids were calmly, positively moving through routines in their environment. They were praising each other. They knew what to do from the moment they entered to the moment they left. I mean, it was beautiful. And so there was this piece of effectiveness that was not being captured in the counts. <laughs> So while the counts I still think are really important because they're really helpful, especially to give feedback to a teacher because they are so objective, the quality, the effectiveness piece is what the CMOT tries to get at. And it tries to get at it again in a really simple user-friendly way. So the CMOT is available on our website. You all have the link and I'm sure Melissa will tag it in. And it's also in the PowerPoint itself that you'll have access to. And it's tiny right now, but I'll blow it up in a second so you can see it with me. The way that we developed it was we had observers who were our grad students. All of them had years of experience as classroom-based teachers. They had had some basic coursework on behavior management. We gave them nothing else to look at this tool. We had them watch hundreds of hours of videos of teachers teaching. They might have slightly lost it, but they watched hundreds of hours of teachers teaching across grade levels. And they used this tool and then some of them used it alongside the counts. So the folks that were doing the counts, we trained really explicitly in our protocol, but we intentionally provided no training on this tool for folks who were gonna use it in the validation because we wanted to see if kind of typical educators who had some years of experience, who might look like an instructional coach or a mentor teacher, or maybe an administrator, if they could just based on the items, land on ratings that match the observations. And they did. They, I mentioned they were watching hours of videos. So there were some things that the videos did not allow us to see really effectively. And that's important because there's a couple of items that didn't make it into the four items that we'll highlight a lot that are still important. And so we cheated and added a checklist to the bottom that is not validated because only four of the items really held up from the measurement perspective. But the cheat was we knew there were some pieces that were not carefully or clearly observed in the video that from other work we believe to be really critical for classroom practice. So we split out the two chunks of items. So the four that are validated, that we have good psychometric data to support using them are active supervision, opportunities to respond, specific praise, and a positive to corrective ratio that's favorable. So those four are the ones that we were able to show worked from a measurement perspective. The six that we cheated and put into a checklist because we knew they were really important, we didn't want them to disappear, is the teacher having a schedule that was posted, so the routine piece, 
having expectations that are posted and taught and prompted, having a physical arrangement that makes sense, having routines that are taught. And those are coming up funny, sorry. Teaching and prompting expectations and then having some additional options for consequence strategies. So the four items are the validated ones, but the other six we think are pretty critical. The six are also not all likely to change from day to day. So you've taught the expectations that's gonna stay true. Like you should teach and review them across time, but like that's gonna stay true. So when we've used this with districts, we've used the four items every time we observe. And then we spot check the six items every once in a while. So that's how we've used it. That doesn't need to be how you all would choose to use it. So at the top, we just ask folks to note the context because as you're going back and trying to remember and give feedback, we wanna just have you all remember what this looks like. Some districts have used this in a de-identified way. So they actually won't write the educator's name. They'll just write the grade level. So you all can think about how you might play this out in your context. The four items, which I'll blow up even more in a second when we dive into what they look like, the four items are all rated on a scale from disagree strongly to agree strongly. And what you're either disagreeing or agreeing with is whether those practices were implemented in a way that's effective. So again, intentionally, there's no explicit training on exactly what that looks like. There's no rubric that says what a one is versus a four. And that was intentional. <laughs> we wanted this to be kind of an experienced educator looking at it and using their best judgment in the context to say, yeah, this is really effective or wow, really not. And then there's two items in between that you can kind of judge. For the checklist items, they are just rated as yes, no's. So there's no kind of gradation. They're either present or they're absent. If anyone wants to geek out and read how this was done, you are free to, but it's a pretty dense measurement article. Um, I'm the first author, but the dense stuff is not stuff I wrote. So even I was struggling to kind of write it in a more user-friendly way. So you can grab it, but maybe not. The CMOD itself is really helpful. And I hope as we dive into it even more, you all will like using it. All right, so that, that's the how. The CMOD is a really important part. It's not the only part, but it should, I think, be one of the data sources that's on your radar to consider. I know for some of you, it's the one of the sources you are considering, but for others, I think you're kind of peeking at it to decide. I'm about to dive us into each item to talk about practices and what they look like. Before we dive, are there any bigger picture questions that would be helpful to chat about or observations, concerns? any and all of that. Okay, I will keep us going. So I said this at the beginning, but I'll just repeat it. We're gonna now dive into what each of those practices look like. And for most, if not all of you, you know them. <laughs> So really put yourself right now in the position of coach, observer, leader, whatever role you have officially, but unofficially, imagine that you're in the various classrooms trying to make a decision as you're watching teachers use these practices. So again, for me, when I'm implementing them myself, way easier to know if I'm doing it or not, because I know what I'm intending, I know what the practice looks like. When I'm watching someone else, <laughs> I sometimes struggle with, well, I think they meant that as a prompt, but that really didn't sound like one. Or maybe that was supposed to be praise, but it doesn't quite sound that way to me. So kind of think about you making those judgments in the context and use that to guide your listening. And then also the questions you might ask as we go through the next chunk, because this is our big chunk of the conversation. Okay. So four validated items. The first one is active supervision. So the item itself, just in super big font, 
asks if the educator effectively engaged in active supervision of students in the classroom. And as you all know, active supervision is moving, scanning, interacting. There's a little note at the bottom that clarifies for us and based on research that effective active supervision is not just doing it, but systematic scanning. So kind of predictable, regular scanning, unpredictable movement. So the kids kind of feel like the teacher could pop up anywhere. And the interactions are spread among and across all students. So in thinking about what that looks like in the classroom, there are really clear, I think, examples and non-examples of active supervision, like the teacher who leaves the room. It's clearly a non-example. The teacher who is always present and moving and constantly interacting is the really clear example. The in-between is where I think it gets a little bit hard. So thinking about the teacher who is having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a student, so super engaged, but the rest of the class is not being monitored at all during that five minute conversation. The teacher who is actively working with a group, but doesn't have eyes up and around on the rest of the class. And one of the things with active supervision is the old, old research on classroom management identified one of the differences between teachers who were effective and teachers who were less effective was their with itness. That was their word for active supervision, kind of how present they were in the environment, how kind of ready they were to respond and support students. And so one of the things I think not just when observing, but when supporting teachers and using active supervision is the small tweaks we can make to allow us to be more successful with this skill. So not right now talking about how to rate it, but talking about how to support this skill. I was in a middle school classroom and I was watching this teacher in one of the examples I just gave. She was meeting individually with a student at the front of the class and the rest of the class was supposed to be doing independent seat work. I was sitting in the back of the room and the way the teacher chose to have these individual student meetings was she turned her back on the class so she could have her full attention on the one kid. So her back is on the class, her one student is in front of her, the rest of the class is behind her. Just picture for a second what a typical middle school class would look like for five minutes without grown up eyes on the kids. So there were kids hitting each other, there were kids passing notes, there were kids swearing curse words, and the teacher literally had no idea. And so when I was chatting with her after that observation, I was, you know, it's great that she's engaged in one-on-one -on -one conversation. That was really positive. She had the other kids with a task, really positive. And so all she had to do to change her practice was switch positions with the, her kid, right? It wasn't like a dramatic change in all the things. It was just switch positions. And just like you check a rear view mirror, scan every 30 to six, I don't know how, how often you're supposed to scan when you drive, but let's just say for classrooms, 30 to 60 seconds, you're scanning the environment and you're popping out praise. So, wow, I love how I see this row or this table or this group or whatever. I love how you're engaged. So really small tweaks to where she's standing and how she's occasionally using praise to be, get a pretty big change in kid behavior. This year, we had observers in, in an elementary school classroom, and the teacher was leading whole group instruction, and a kid literally got sick. The teacher didn't notice. So she was so focused on what she was teaching that she missed a student, like very full sensory experience, getting sick in class. And it took her several minutes of all the other kids reacting before she noticed. So that the idea of just scanning, even when, again, she was doing great with trying to focus on her instruction. So it wasn't that she wasn't doing something really well, but in intentionally focusing on her instruction, she missed the active supervision piece. So thinking active supervision, those small tweaks you can make to make a big difference, that scanning is critical. The movement, critical. <laughs> kind of hearing as you're doing that critical because when a student gets sick, you should be able to not only see, but also hear that there's a change in the environment that you would respond to. 
during the pandemic and some of our classrooms that still use remote or online instruction, the movement part wasn't as prevalent, but again, those other components still carry you through the active supervision that allows you to be successful. So I gave some examples and non-examples. What are some other things you all have seen or noticed with active supervision that's either been really effective or maybe less effective? Or as you're thinking about those middle categories that are kind of in a gray area. You can put examples in chat, you can share examples. Yeah, as students are on their computers being monitored by the teacher on the computer, is that the teacher then being able to kind of see what's going on on their screens with? Yeah, I was, for some of the monitoring on screens, I've been impressed with software that allows teachers to know what's going on. And sometimes even though you might walk in and think that's not really wonderful active supervision, them being able to use that software to monitor screen activity may actually be more effective than walking by where kids can very quickly minimize and maximize what they want their teacher to see. Teachers always on their phones would, I'm assuming, be a very clear non-example of active supervision. Um, yeah, I do think just appreciating how hard this is, like the teacher who's really focused on the small group that's great that they're really engaged with the small group and they have to multitask periodically. So if you're in there seeing, well, this part is great, this part needs improvement, kind of the strategies that we might give them, they could even set a timer, like a vibrating timer in their pocket to look up so that while they're super engaged, they still have their reminder to pause. Um, sorry, I'm not keeping up with chat super well. Teacher always sitting at their desk, that is a pet peeve of mine. My kids' school just redesigned classrooms, so teachers no longer have the, the teacher desk. There's pros and cons to that, but it is going to probably be a game changer for active supervision. Only scanning parts of the classroom or specific groups of kids. That, I think, is really a helpful part of this observation, because I'll just, even teaching grad classes, I'll notice that my tendency is to walk to one side of the room and it doesn't matter who's sitting on that side. Like, but I, like I have these habits of myself and because of where I stand, I then do a scan in a predictable way, which for grad students, probably they're self-managing. Okay. But it, I've noticed for myself, I have to intentionally plan something different or I just get stuck in my habit. And then I'm not, I'm not effectively doing active supervision. Yeah, ignoring students, interacting with observers, that is a problem. As an observer, you're going to have to kind of set the context for what teachers should do when you come in and what they should do is ignore you. <laughs> they need to just kind of carry on their business, um, but that's sometimes hard. I love the Ferris Bueller example. Um, yeah, really thinking about the teacher being moved, kind of moving among students. And <laughs> figuring out how to write while also monitoring students is I think all of these are things that many of us have had to figure out, but those are fantastic examples and non-examples. Thank you for popping those into chat. So we're going to do just to make it super clear, a couple of quick thumbs up, thumbs down activities for active supervision. And some of these are based on examples that I have shared or some of the real things that we have experienced, obviously changed in terms of details to protect the innocent. All right. So during instruction, the teacher moves around the classroom. He scans the room to monitor engagement and interacts with students briefly to support learning, he uses thumbs up and thumbs down or thumbs up to students who are engaged and does a quick redirect to get kids back on task. Does that sound like this teacher is effectively using active supervision. Yeah, you can do electronic or real, whatever y'all prefer. Yeah, this, I mean, if you were seeing it in the room, you might have a better sense of effective or not, but from the description, it sounds like they actually did all the components. They were moving, they were scanning, they were interacting, the interactions were brief, so didn't interrupt the kids. If the kids are on task, you don't want to stop them working to have a quick like conversation, but it kept the kids engaged and moving. All right, this teacher while teaching, the student has a visible, 
visible medical incident. The teacher just keeps teaching in the front of the room without noticing the student's needs for at least a couple of minutes until the peers are calling out for help. Yeah, clearly not. Like these are the really kind of extreme examples, non-examples. So the teacher missed the opportunity to move, scan, interact. They were so focused on what they were doing. And in this example, they missed a medical need, which is pretty important, obviously, in classrooms. So the other piece that I think sometimes counteracts with active supervision is many of us, when we were initially trained, had planned ignoring as one of our go-to strategies. <laughs> so I'm thinking back to an observation that I did again in a middle school, but it was a music classroom. And the teacher was standing in front of the classroom and teaching. And we've all heard the expression like kids climbing walls. The kids were literally climbing walls. <laughs> there were rafters and there were kids up and on rafters and in instruments. She just kept teaching. And when we talked to her about why, it was because she was implementing planned ignoring. So she had missed the opportunity to effectively do a lot of other practices we're about to talk about. But it also appeared she was not doing any active supervision. And she was aware of what was going on because I was sitting there thinking, are you just missing all of this? <laughs> and in this case, she wasn't missing it, but she was using what she thought was an effective management strategy. So I also think having the conversation about why becomes really helpful. And I'll share one last thing and then we'll move on to the next one. I think this is a harder skill than sometimes we think it is. Like when we say move, scan, interact, it seems super simple. We've already talked through some of the examples. Part of the reason why it's hard is because teachers are doing so many other things and often they're doing some of those other things really well, right? Like if you're teaching a small group, you're really focused on that. When I've done this either in non-classroom or classroom settings, I've sometimes had to give folks or have them develop for themselves a plan for what it looks like and sounds like. So literally either have them draw out a map of how they're gonna walk. For me, myself, make sure that that map is not always the same path that I typically take when I walk through a classroom. When it's multiple grownups in the classroom, like if it's a teacher who has assistants or aides, intentionally thinking about where and how all the grownups are going to be set up, set up in the classroom to make sure active, su active supervision is possible. And we're promoting engagement and independence of our students. So I'll just say for this, and I'll probably say for all of them, what seems simple can be really challenging for folks to implement. So not assuming prior knowledge, not assuming that mentioning active supervision to someone is enough to change how you observe it the next time but really thinking intentionally about how you would coach and support someone to improve active supervision. All right, questions, comments, or other pieces on active supervision before we jump into the next one. Okay. So next one is opportunities to respond. And this is a term that we use all the time in research, depending on how or where folks were trained, it may not be a familiar term. So an opportunity to respond is anything the teacher does that solicits or invites an observable, measurable response from a student. So asking a question, prompting them to write, asking for a gestural response, all of those, and I could keep going, all of those count as opportunities to respond if it's something the teacher has set up to solicit the students responding. The teacher can also set up opportunities for kids to do this with each other. So it doesn't always have to be teacher directed. It can be peer to peer. It can be technology directed, but it's any of those active opportunities for the kids to participate in instruction. The traditional ways teachers sometimes do this, and I myself do this when I'm not planful about it, is like I have done a couple of times already. I'll be like, so does anyone have a question? <laughs> does anyone want to share? And sometimes in a virtual environment, that's effective because there's a chat box so everyone can do that at once. But in an in-person environment, that means probably only one or two folks are actually going to be able to participate in that response. So really effective OTRs or opportunities to respond. Think about a variety of ways kids can engage. 
match those that variety to kids' needs and abilities. So if you're providing opportunities that not all kids actually can access, that's not an effective or equitable opportunity. And it also builds in lots of response modalities. So not only does that keep it interesting for kids who can use all modalities, but it makes sure that kids have options for how they respond. So it allows it to differentiate and meet the needs of each and every kid. We're doing a study right now where we went into a few classrooms and we're working with educators who are frankly fantastic. Their rates of these skills during our baseline phase were phenomenal. But the challenge we've given them is to identify one kid with a disability. So these are all inclusive general ed settings who has some pretty intensive needs. And we've asked them while we're tracking their overall rates of these skills, we've asked them to only count their own skill use if it is appropriate and includes this one kid. So in their tier one instruction, we've asked them to really intentionally think about how they're providing opportunities to all that also meet the needs of the one. And the conversations we've had with the teachers during these trainings have been phenomenal. So in thinking about how to do opportunities to respond effectively in a tier one context, the so tier one instruction, but in a way that's differentiated to meet the needs of kids who might actually need tier two or tier three instruction in this specific content area. The teachers are doing things like thinking about how to pre-train some of the opportunities, thinking about how to differentiate. So they might ask a question for a verbal response, but this kid might have pre-printed cards that they're gonna use to respond. One teacher was really wanting the kid to practice verbal responses. And so they just they decided for every opportunity, they were going to do it twice. They were going to do it once and have gestural responses because that this kid was fluent with responding to gestures. Then they were going to do it a second time, but prompt a verbal response. So the intentionality of this skill, if you're actually thinking about it, what it looks like to do it in an equitable way, is a different level of implementation. So again, as you're thinking about not just using this tool, but how you're gonna coach and train and support from it, kind of building deeply into this content becomes, I think, really fun and really challenging for some teachers. So I've said most of this, but I will just kind of reiterate, an OTR is anything, an opportunity to respond is anything that solicits or invites a student response. We've already said, observable, measurable ways to engage are critical. One thing I haven't mentioned specifically is the rate. So while we're not gonna count for this tool, there is a piece of kind of how often kids are engaged. And the research on opportunities to respond says, especially for younger kids, having a rate of about three a minute is desirable. For review tasks, where you're kind of going back through skills, the recommended rate is actually closer to six or eight to eight opportunities to respond a minute. And every time I've read that, I thought it was mythical. It's like, that's like the unicorn level that no one sees. In the study I just mentioned, at baseline, one of the teachers was at eight per minute. The kid that we were targeting, the student was, who was identified as not benefiting from eight per minute, so her rate has actually come down as we've asked her to really intentionally focus on this one kid. But high rate is really high. And so my colleagues in early reading call it a perky pace. That's not my favorite phrase. But there is a piece to the pacing of opportunities to respond that needs to be you know, adjusted for different age groups and different populations. But it should be that they're coming fast enough that the kids stay engaged. There's also this piece in why I like this tool, that there's a trade-off sometimes between quantity and quality, like especially with older students who can provide more complex and thoughtful responses. You don't want to try and hit eight a minute, so every question is simple. So that's where the effectiveness conversation comes in. It's not just about getting them out as fast as you can. It's about really how do we authentically and importantly engage as many learners as possible in every moment of instruction. 
that may be a really deep peer-to-peer conversation on a topic that's been set up that the rate would look low, but the kids are really engaged. So kind of think about those pieces. Unless I just saw your comment about Anita Archer. I love that. Yeah, it's having him do say or write something. And quick tangent, but during the pandemic, watching Anita Archer's presentations, I think it was actually the Michigan presentations where she modeled in a virtual environment how to do OTRs. I don't know if you all saw those videos, but I found myself sitting alone on my couch and responding to her. Like it was so effective. So that level of engagement is just really important. The general average of OTRs, so it depends on if you mean what teachers are actually doing or what they're doing when it's considered effective. So the what they're doing when it's considered effective is that three a minute. In some of the high school literature, it drops usually, so great question, usually about once a minute, I think it's considered effective on average. So that doesn't mean every minute. But on average in a high school, middle school, that means you're getting some responses that are longer. It means some that are lower. In our research, when we go up in ages, we've started also just tracking whether at the end of the minute, the kids are still engaged in that opportunity. So rather than wanting, again, a high rate, we've tried to say, is engagement happening? Even if the one opportunity takes five minutes to respond to, what they're actually doing is often way lower. So in Terry Scott has done research across all age ranges. Some of Elise Paz and Catherine Bradshaw's teams have gone in and specifically looked at high schools. I can find it for you. My memory is that they're typically lower than once a minute. When we go in with our studies, if we're going in with teachers who need help mightily, we're seeing rates at or below once a minute. When we're going into classrooms like we're in right now, where the teachers are doing really well and we're just trying to help them kind of tweak or become more intentional, we are seeing rates that are two to three times a minute, even in baseline. The one that's eight a minute blew me out of the water. So that's not typical, but we are seeing rates that are kind of two or three times a minute. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Melissa. I love that you're throwing graphs in as I'm talking. That's fantastic. (laughs) All right. So this is one of those skills that's really critical. There are ways we can make this easier for teachers and depending on context, some of these ways sound great and some of these sound aversive. So there's not one way that we can increase, but some of the practices that have a lot of evidence for increasing opportunities to respond and therefore student outcomes are scripted direct instruction materials. In one of the studies we're doing right now, we're using scripted reading and I have to say, even though not everyone likes scripts, it's been really effective at getting folks up and running with practices and the rates of OTRs and things are looking good in the study because the teachers have materials that prompt it. Not all computer assisted instruction is good, but there are evidence-based programs that really increase OTRs and then tailor and branch them for kids. Classified peer tutoring is a really specific evidence-based approach to getting peers to support each other. With older students, even things like guided notes where teachers use more of a lecture format are ways to get kids engaged. I use those even with grad students. Um, Response cards, clicker systems, some of the ways that we can pre-program responses to get quick responses. My middle school son, his teachers use lots of online games to get high rates of opportunities to respond. So there are so many ways that teachers can build it into their style of learning or style of teaching that still get us to the kind of increased rates of opportunities to respond? Yeah, so that's a really good question. When I'm saying these rates, the goal is to have as many kids experience that rate as possible. So some of the research out there is on kind of how to use opportunities and whether choral responding is better than individual responding or whatever. So. If I'm in a classroom, I get really excited when I see teachers think about ways that can get all kids responding. And you do have to differentiate because as you're saying, like there's different times to speak. And that's where some of the teachers will kind of pre-teach, pre-correct, set kids up for success so that they have the possibility to respond along with their peers. Choral responding is decent because it gives all kids an opportunity at the same time to respond. 
we've all also been the kid probably, or certainly seen the kids who in a choral response kind of wait for one of the other kids to respond with the correct answer and then quickly start saying it so they sound correct too. Um, so choral responding is good to get all kids engaged, but it probably doesn't give us a good feel for who knows the skills. And some kids can also not respond and not be noticed. So things like whiteboards, response cards, clicker systems that actually let us see responses and get data from kids are really helpful. In some of the classrooms that I've seen, and I've even done this again with older students, having them have a chance to peer talk and then share a response. So they have a little more confidence that a couple of them agree on the response before they share. That also gives multiple ways to respond. So there's, there's lots of strategies that we can help support teachers to think about boosting opportunities to respond in terms of number. And again, number and quality need to be considered together. So it's not just getting the rate up, it's making sure they're high quality, important responses. Yeah, and I, I do think it's a balance. In my prior life before coming to UConn, I directed a school where every kid was identified with a disability and we had kids who were nonverbal and kids who were highly verbal, but maybe not always with the right, with words that were appropriate, some of them were expert in four letter words, for example. Um, how we engage them look different, right? Like, so really thinking about, I keep using the words robust and differentiated, but to me, that's the hallmark of good tier one. It's strong enough to set most kids up for success so it's robust and it's thoughtfully implemented and differentiated so that all kids have the ability to access that tier one. The, again, examples with these teachers that we're working with right now have just been so phenomenal to watch them talk through how they're going to tailor what they're already doing well for all to meet the needs of one. And that trade-off has been, I mean, I had ideas based on how I had done it, but watching them kind of think about it in the context of their classrooms has been really exciting. I'm going to just make sure I've not missed anything in chat. Um yeah, I do think with older students, it is kind of thinking about ways to set them up for success. And in this tool and in this presentation, we're talking about these skills in isolation, but like doing this in a classroom that's unhealthy and punitive is obviously a much different experience than getting kids to engage in a classroom that is safe and supportive and celebrates like even attempts at success. I mean, I think about all the ways we can even praise kids when they make a mistake. Wow, I love that you engaged. Thank you for trying. Here's what you said that I loved. And let me just adjust it a little bit. Or, hey, how can I help add? Sorry, it would not be a Zoom call if there was not a dog barking in the background. Um, how can I like adjust a little bit your response to get you to where I need you to be? Or how can I have peers help build on it? So there's lots of ways I think we can help teachers not only create the opportunity, but have it be safe for kids who can respond to feel comfortable responding, and then how we can differentiate to make sure every kid actually can respond, right? So I'm going to just walk us through a couple of examples and non-examples for opportunities to respond. Again, I know you all know this, but just thinking about the range of things you're going to see and getting us engaged with some OTRs to me is kind of a fun way to intersperse a little bit. So this teacher points to a poster of rules for adding fraction, fractions and says, on your whiteboards, write the answer to the equation, one half plus one fourth equals, and look at me when you're done. Probably better to even say, hold up your whiteboard when you're done. Oops, so is that an opportunity to respond or not? If you weren't confident, I just gave you the answer by clicking too fast. <laughs> So yeah, it is. And this is actually a great one. Again, assuming kids had the math skills to respond effectively, it's a great one because all kids are responding and the teacher just quickly scanning the whiteboard. Whiteboards can see that the kids had the correct answer or didn't and would then know where to follow up and target their kind of follow-up instruction. All right, this one. The educator points to a poster of the rules or expectations and says, remember to show respect during a transition by staying to the right of the hallway and allowing personal space. Mm 
Yeah, I had this one probably as a no. I mean, you could argue, well, it's an opportunity for the kid to demonstrate the behavior, but unless they're right there about to do it, and unless the kids act, I mean, to me, this one sounds a little bit more like a prompt, right? It's a reminder for how to engage in the correct social behavior. It's probably not an immediate opportunity to respond. Kids are not giving us academic responses or answers. So good thing to do to remind kids, but probably not your best opportunity to respond example. Okay, before I keep going, questions or other observations on opportunities to respond? All right, so then the next one is specific praise. And this is one of those skills that seems easy, <laughs> seems like common sense. And yet this one is often implemented at a very low levels in our classrooms. And that's not to say that classrooms are always super negative. What we see more often than not, and this may or may not be y'all's experience, but what we've seen more often than not is that we go into classrooms and educators are doing pretty well with general praise. So they're popping out like, good job. All right. Awesome. But they're not necessarily pausing to name the behavior they're praising. And the reason specific praise is important, actually, let me pause for a second and make sure we know what it is before I keep going. So what the item says is they effectively specifically praise and we're giving them credit if it's either academic or social emotional behavioral skills. So whatever they are praising, they get credit for specific praise. And we've clarified, and I love the connection to meaningful feedback that was just popped into chat. We've clarified that specific praise names the behavior. So that's important. And some of it is these qualitative pieces that are slightly harder to measure, but specific praise should be contingent, meaning it comes right after the kid, they see the kid's behavior. It should be genuine. So sarcasm, not an example of specific praise. <laughs> and it should be contextually and culturally appropriate or relevant which means that it can't look like a one size fits all approach, right? Like for some kids, shouting out specific praise in front of their whole class, is gonna be highly reinforcing. Like they're gonna love that attention. That's gonna be awesome. For other kids, that would actually function more like a punisher. That doesn't mean those other kids don't need specific praise. It means they shouldn't have it shouted out publicly in front of their peers. So one of the cool things that I know Kent McIntosh and some of his work has done is done a praise preference assessment. So asking kids how they would like to receive positive feedback. Do they want it shared publicly? Do they want it private? Do they want it verbal? Do they want it in writing? For some of my students, it had to be on a post-it note slipped into their desk because if I had said it out loud and when I did make the mistake and say it out loud, they very quickly let me know how unappreciated it was but the feedback was appreciated. So the contingent, genuine, culturally and contextually relevant pieces are critical and sometimes where we see the mistakes happen. The other thing I think sometimes creates barriers to specific praise is we often give really long examples of what it looks like and sounds like. And when you're trying to be fast with your instruction, when you're trying to keep kids engaged with high rates of opportunities to respond, for example, as we just talked about, if you pause to do like a three sentence praise statement that interrupts the flow of your instruction. So we've tried to be more intentional with really short examples of specific praise, like nice hand raise counts as specific praise. Thanks for coming in the room quietly, slightly longer, but still shorter than three sentences. <laughs> So the other piece we've seen in our research and just practice is when we give people examples, it seems less meaningful than when they write them themselves. So when we work with teachers on this skill, we give them examples because we want to make sure they know what it looks like and doesn't look like. But then we give them time to say, think about your expectations or norms in your classroom. Think about your kids. Think about the things you actually want to see kind of increase or maintain in your classroom 
and write down words that would sound natural coming out of your mouth that name the behavior and are positive. And we give them time to actually write it down. And for some of them, it's easy because they can think about what they've said in the last five minutes. But for others, it's really hard. Like being able to name a behavior and praise it at the same time is not a fluent skill for them yet. So at least by writing it down, they've thought through a few examples and then they start to practice them. So the reason this is so critical again, it's because research tells us not only that it doesn't happen very often, but it tells us also that when it does happen, it leads to better outcomes for students. So I mentioned already, we try to give some short examples of phrase statements. That doesn't mean there aren't times to have a long conversation about how phenomenal something was from a kid, but we try and give them examples that don't interrupt instruction. We also give them some non-examples. I say awesome all the time, but it's not a very specific phrase statement. So it's not a bad thing to say. It's just not helpful in terms of naming the behavior. A quick redirection is a really helpful way to respond and correct, but it's not a praise statement. And again, sarcasm, definitely not a praise statement. So thank you, Melissa, for popping in the praise preference assessment. I love the idea of sentence stems to get people going. So this is my slightly ridiculous non-example. I mentioned the school that I used to direct was a, a school that served kids with pretty intensive needs. They all got to us because they had long histories of really aggressive behavior towards self or others. And so we were a setting that had kind of expectations for ourselves, a really high fidelity implementation of evidence-based practices. So we, every month, went in and did direct observations with our teachers, and we graphed their data across time in addition to all of our kids' data, because that was just built into our model. I had this one teacher who, I had most of my teachers who were amazing, but this one teacher who thought this was ridiculous. And so he had downloaded a list of 101 ways to praise a kid that was written in the 1970s. So every time we came in with a clipboard and we always let people know when we were observing because we wanted to at least be kind of respectful so they were not feeling like they were observed without their knowledge. He would pull out the list either of literally or from his memory. And so as soon as we started taking data, all of his non-examples looked like hot dog, wowee, high five, all right. And so he was saying like food products contingent on no behavior and his kids had pretty significant intellectual disabilities. The likelihood that saying hot dog did anything other than like make somebody hungry. It was just, I mean, it was such the non-example. I share it not just because it's kind of funny, <clears throat> but because I do think there's this piece when teachers know we're watching for this and when they know they're supposed to do more, he's the extreme example, <laughs> but we sometimes do get some weird kind of increases in these skills. So we really want to help teachers remember the importance of it being genuine and authentic and connected to what we're seeing. It's not just that we want these rates kind of bumped up artificially. Um, yes, and thank you for the reminder about what sarcasm means. It's horrible, says someone who's sarcastic pretty frequently, but in the right context, <laughs> so carefully sarcastic. Okay. So again, just quick activity. We're not going to do this for every one of the items. This might be one of the last ones. Um, so our goal is to say, is this behavior specific praise, yes or no? So a student enters the classroom during educator-directed instruction and the kid quietly walks to their seat. The educator gives them a thumbs up to recognize their quiet entry. Is that specific praise? I mean, I think it's a good thing to do. <laughs> so it didn't interrupt instruction. It was a quick gesture. If they had pre-taught, like when I do this, it means that like, I really appreciate the behavior. So there's ways, again, I think that could be really effective, but it's not specific praise. So our message is not, don't do this. In fact, please keep doing this and do it even more. But the message is that we want to help teachers be specific. I always use my son as the example. He's my middle schooler and he is incredibly talented at lots of things. And usually in any given moment, he's doing multiple behaviors and probably one of them is super appropriate. And the other three are probably not. 
So if I don't praise specifically, there is a good chance that I have given him positive feedback for a whole bunch of things that I don't even know are happening and that I don't want to keep happening. So the specific part is important because it tags the praise to the right behavior. So the thumbs up might have tagged it to that behavior for that kid, but it may not have. So the tagging part is what's really important for specific. Okay, so in this case, the student enters the class, quietly walks to their seat, and the educator walks over and just quietly whispers, thank you for coming in the room quietly. Specific praise? Yeah. So it doesn't have to be loud, it can be private, but in this case, they gave the specific feedback for the behavior they wanted to see increase. So great example. The um, Another quick, silly, but extreme non-example. In our research, we often have teachers use golf counters. And so we know because we're seeing them click when they think that they've used a skill. And one of our middle school teachers who had lots of great strengths, but on this one day, she was just having a day. And so in one observation, we heard her say to a student, meow, pretty kitty, click. And I'll, that was positive for her. It was maybe not even species specific, <laughs> but it was positive. And then we also heard her say, thank you for trying to be human, click. So we had, she was one of the people who taught me a lot about how important it was to emphasize the genuine kind of contingent, authentic piece of praise. And we also had to talk to her about like, while she loved cats and had cats on every surface flat or vertical in her classroom, Meow Pretty Kitty is probably not for some kids going to be sufficient to connect the praise to the behavior. So again, while this is a not super hard skill in terms of knowing what it looks like, sounds like it is a much harder skill to provide specific praise in the moment. And for some of us, me included, like our sarcasm or something comes through and maybe interferes with our ability to provide really clear praise. So before I move into the next one, although it's up on the screen, are there other questions, comments, great examples you want to celebrate around specific praise? So I just wanted to chime in about that specifically because uh, saying to a kid that was really smart is also one of those things that it had never really occurred to me till, you know, in being in education that that is really a terrible comment um, because you're acting as if smart is something that someone inherently is instead of saying that choice was smart or whatever. Um, so I think it's interesting. The words you choose are very, very impactful. Yeah. And I think the other thing that brings up for me is depending on folks, other trainings. So what other kind of pieces they've been trained in, people often have either helpful, as you just shared, helpful thoughts about how to be really precise in their language. I have also seen some trainings make teachers so worried about saying the wrong thing that they don't use the skill. So responsive classroom is a training approach that I love and I think does a lot of good. And back in the day, George and I actually met with the developers of responsive classroom and like the level of agreement we had between what classroom practices looked like was really high. Like we were all using different words but saying and doing very much the same things in classrooms. So this is, again, I just wanna be very clear. I love that approach. It has nice evidence. In our region, there's been a couple of trainers that then I see the folks come into our trainings um, who have trained that you shouldn't praise. And part of it is that they operationally define praise to be something other than what it is in the research literature. And they've even gone as far that approach and then one other one that's really prevalent in the Northeast to say you can do harm by praising. And so we have educators coming into trainings who are worried about using the skill the right way. And some of them are worried about using it at all. So I've been probably more erring on the side of you're not going to hurt a kid by providing positive feedback. 
because it's become for some a barrier to them doing it at all. But I loved your comment about like, once you're doing it, let's be even more intentional about the words that we're choosing. But as you all are going into different classrooms, some of those misrules have just created big barriers for people. And maybe that's unique to our region because I think there are some some pieces that are trainers that live in our area. And so maybe that has not made it out your way, but just to kind of, I have aired very much on the side of let's get you doing it. <laughs> let's get you doing it fluently. And then let's work on how well you're doing it in terms of like shaping the, the language that you use. Because I just want to get people away from thinking I can harm a kid by saying the slightly wrong thing with praise. And I really liked your intentional language. So I think both things are true, but maybe if you're thinking about a continuum of how you're going to eventually help shape practice, the initial piece is let's get them doing it, get them doing it well, get it positive, get it specific, and then start to shape kind of how they're using those words to be even more specific to the behaviors and the skills. So thank you for that comment, because I actually had meant to say some of that earlier and I had forgotten because I didn't prompt it in my slides. Any other comments, questions, or feedback about specific praise? Okay, so this next item is the same thing, but it's a nuanced version of it and it's why it made it in distinct from an item on specific praise. So in addition to just using specific praise, we want educators to think about their ratio. And you all know these ratios because you have heard them 5 million times that we should be more positive than corrective. And if you've been in the field long enough, you have heard a bunch of different numbers tagged to those ratios. <laughs> so you've probably heard four to one. You might've heard six or eight to one, which is what comes out of the marriage literature. You might've heard more recently, I've been using five to one because there was a Clay Cook study that documented five to one. It's also one study. In there's one study, one, <laughs> It also says for kids with more intensive needs, so kids at risk or identified with emotional and behavioral disorders, we should be hitting closer to a nine to one. So you notice that we didn't put numbers in the item stem. We just said a favorable positive to corrective ratio. Because probably that ratio looks a little bit different based on context, based on age, based on student need, based on like all the other host of factors. But regardless of the specific number, kids should have a lot more positive interactions than corrective ones. Before I keep going. <laughs> so the other piece that I think sometimes gets missed in the overall conversation about the ratio is what that means for each and every kid. So if I'm the teacher and I'm thinking about my four to one ratio, five to one ratio, nine to one ratio, whatever, and I'm tallying my comments, I'm going to know that I said however many positives, however many correctives. What I probably don't know is if I actually did that for every single kid in my class. And honestly, we can't ask teachers to track that for every single kid in their class because they're doing too many other things. But conceptually, <clears throat> what it means is if my son is in your class and he's going to get a lot of corrections because he is. <laughs> It means for him that you have to actually be really intentional about catching him with praise because he is going to pull the corrections because he needs them. He needs reminders and redirections, but for him to experience a positive classroom environment, it's not just that like the other kids and he included gets a few praise statements, but he needs even more to have his experience be more positive than corrective. And I mention that because the research is actually the opposite. So the research when people go out and look at distributions of praise is that kids who are identified with disabilities or identified as at risk or kids of color or the intersection of those two. So a kid who is identifying as black and has a disability are the most likely to experience corrections, not in every study, but in some of the studies. And the least likely to experience high rates of opportunities to respond and high rates of positives. So that intentionality of this ratio is a more nuanced conversation if we're really centering equity. It means not that we're asking teachers to take data on their skills with every kid because they would 
talking about teacher shortage, we would lose teachers really quickly if we asked them to constantly track that. But it does mean, as the observer, that's something we should be paying attention to. So when we're thinking about effective, are we seeing that this is equitable? Are we seeing that teachers are doing this in a way that's actually allowing every kid, or at least the majority of kids in that observation, to experience more positive th positives than correctives? And again, that involves differentiating. So the teachers I keep mentioning that we're working with right now to have their tier one strategies also meet the, meet the needs of the one <laughs> are thinking about how that kid is included in their whole class praise and because that kid gets frequent reminders and redirections, how that kid gets extra doses of praise. So is there increasing opportunities to respond for all kids, but also this kid? They're pairing every opportunity to respond with the praise statement. So the kid responds, they get praise. Kid responds, they get praise. So the praise rates become high and the corrections start to go down because the kid is engaged in getting positive feedback. So there is an intentionality of putting these together that allows kids to benefit in an equitable way. And this is not like you flip the switch and do it tomorrow. This is a nuanced, harder skill, but it's where we should be kind of pushing. And so over time, it's where as coaches, observers, people working with students and teachers, we're starting to think about how to help them really continue to make tier one robust and differentiated to meet the needs of all. So we already saw the definition of specific praise before. I bumped in the definition of specific corrections. What wasn't embedded in that statement that we, or those, that conversation we just had was what corrections should look like. <clears throat> so as we're thinking about the ratio, it's also important that any corrections that are given are instructionally focused and have the intent of setting the kids up for success the next time. So it is rare that I have to kind of give teachers feedback on overusing specific praise or using it with too long of a sentence or using it with too much emotion. Occasionally we have to have that conversation if it's not working for an individual kid, but usually we're not worried about changing that dimension of teacher's use of praise. But if you think about error corrections, we sometimes are giving feedback around, let's keep it as brief as possible. Let's do it in a calm, neutral, business-like way. Let's remember that even if we're correcting a social, emotional, behavioral error, errors in my book include things like telling us where to go, that are not nice places, up to and including hurting folks, right? Errors can be small or errors can be big. But if we are correcting an error, academic or social emotional behavioral, our goal is to provide the information the kid needs to be successful the next time. There might be other things we're doing in addition to that. So I'm not saying that's all, but the purpose of an error correction is instructional. It's to make it less likely for that error to repeat and to make it more likely for the kid to get it right the next time. And for social emotional behavioral, right is that they're matching behavior to the context, right? That if they're in the cafeteria, they're talking instead of raising their hand. But if they're in class, maybe they're raising their hands before they're talking. Yeah, and Kristen, thank you. It's just that we're treating behavior like any other skill. But for some reason, for us as grownups, it feels different. <laughs> So for some of our teachers, this is where things like neutralizing routines and de-escalation and kind of self-calming strategies come in to let error corrections for behavior sound the same as they look for academics. And I mention all of that not only because it's a better experience for the kids and for us as grown-ups, but it actually works better. There's research that like calm, quiet corrections work a lot better than loud corrections that might sound like yelling. So not only is it kind of a better experience, but it actually results in better outcomes as well. Okay. So examples and non-examples of the ratio is that the educator obviously provides at least five or more praise statements. And in the last slide, I had the unicorn because I kind of think about the five to one as the magical ratio because who knows if it's actually true, might change, but right now five to one seems like a good target. 
Um, and on the positive example side is that every kid experiences praise in that ratio. Obviously the non-examples is an inverted ratio where there's more corrections than positives. In some classrooms, we see them actually parallel, which would also be a non-example. And then the other non-example is the one we were just talking about that they do provide more praise overall, but there are individual kids in that classroom that are getting way more corrections than positives. So that again, the goal is overall, all kids experience more positives than correctives. Okay, so before I keep going, other questions, comments, concerns, nuances around that positive to corrective ratio? Not to the ratio, Brandy, but um, recently I heard a presenter talk about corrections to include um, prompts and, and help. So like we're always coming at kids to prompt them to do something, to help them do something, to correct it and counting that um, as you're thinking about your ratio. And I'm curious as to your thoughts about that. Yeah, thank you for saying that. Cause I think any good correction like signals the error. So again, just like for specific praise, if I just say no, stop or don't, the kid doesn't necessarily know which thing they're supposed to stop doing. So it does signal the error, but it then tells them what to do instead. So it either kind of reteaches or if they know the skill and they just forgot to use it, it prompts or reminds. And for some error corrections, it also gives them a chance to practice the skill and then get positive feedback after practicing. If a kid is escalated and so you're doing a quick redirection, that might not be the time to ask them to practice the skill because you don't actually want to start a power struggle. But I, your point is, right on that the goal of a good correction is to set them up for success the next time it's to prompt to provide opportunities for practice and to get the kid right back on track so they're starting to get positive feedback again the next second at least the next minute maybe the next second is overstating it but you know soon <laughs> yeah thank you other questions comments feedback Okay, so we are now moving out of the four items that have a lot of the kind of measurement validation behind them. And we are moving into the six items that, that are the checklist. These are the ones I keep saying we kind of cheated because from a measurement perspective, they should have dropped out. But from a real life perspective, they needed to stay in because we know these things are critical in classrooms. So the first one is just that the educator has posted the schedule for the class or the activity. And that can look in a variety of different ways, whether you're in a high school classroom that only has the kids for 45 minutes, or you're in an elementary or a self-contained setting that has the kids all day long. So the critical features are not that it looks in a specific way. The critical features are that it's posted in a way that is accessible to the students. So if kids can't read, it should not be posted only in words. If kids are tiny, it should not be posted only where a grown-up can read it. So just thinking about, again, it's posted and it is accessible to students. And as an observer, this is always the first thing I look for whenever I walk into a classroom, is would I know what's coming next? So as an observer, like you should walk in and within a second, or again, at least a minute, you should know what the kids are doing right now. And you should know it because you're seeing them do it, but also because it's on the board or agenda or whatever. And you should know what they're going to transition to next. This seems like common sense. And for those of you who are in classrooms that are functioning really well, it is like it's just there. But when I'm asked to go into a classroom with an educator who's really struggling, this is often completely absent. Like the kids don't know what's coming next. The educators don't know what's coming next. So the activity finishes and the kids have about five minutes of downtime while the educator goes back to their desk or their computer and tries to remember what the next thing is. And I've seen that in self-contained settings with kids with more intensive behavioral needs. So you can only imagine what five minutes of downtime looks like in that classroom. So this is should be easy but is again, one of those things that sometimes teachers need help to even know what it looks like, how to plan it, how to post it, how to make it accessible. So some, again, even these things that feel and seem easy are not always easy. 
And yeah, I would count Google Classroom post. I mean, in high school, it might be that it's actually in a kid's agenda. So it may not be on the board, but it's in front of them. So you might have to do a little bit more sleuthing to make sure that it is visible and accessible. But um, yeah, I don't think there's, again, one way it needs to look <clears throat> as long as it is posted for the learners and the educator <laughs> and in a format that is accessible to all of them. Have you all seen either really effective or kind of questionable ways that folks have done this? It would be helpful to share or chat about. Hopefully for most of the classrooms, this is a simple check, but it is, it, for me at least, it's always the first check when I go into a room. All right, so I think I actually talked through most of these already, but positive example is the educator posting the schedule with times and activities, again, written or posted in pictures or whatever in an accessible format. It might be that it doesn't stay up permanently, but I know in some of the classrooms we've observed, it's on their smart board. And so it's not always up, but they have kind of organizers that move kids through the activities and it pops up kind of in between transitions. So you might have to be in the class for 10 minutes before you realize that, but it is there and it's clearly effectively used. Um, that non-examples are they post only writing for kids with limited reading, which we've already talked about. Some teachers, I think, get a little bit confused about what this looks like opposed to what they might have in other pocket charts. So while pocket charts are awesome and can do lots of things, like the pocket chart that has the date and the weather is not the same thing as actually posting the schedule for the day or the activities for the day. Um, yeah, sometimes it's posted, but it's from like last semester. So having one that's actually relevant for the current context is really helpful. Um, having images that are actually like if we're translating from words to pictures, making sure the pictures do actually have relevant information in them and are salient for the kids and have been taught. And yeah, I think some some teachers, maybe it's more at the secondary level, especially if they have the kids for less time, don't think of it as as, as critical. Um, but even as grownups, like I didn't give you all times for how we're spending the next two hours, but we started off with a list of questions. We keep coming back to them. Like I wanna know as a learner, where I am, what's coming next, kind of that piece. So to me, it's critical for all ages. Yeah, and my favorite of all of these is, well, the kids should just know. And maybe that's true in April that they've taught them and the kids are super fluent, but frankly, all of us have a day where we could use a little extra reminder. So having it posted is helpful, even if I already know what the routine looks like and what's expected. Um, and there are lots of examples online. I pulled like a few pictures into this, the presentation that I had, but there are lots of examples of what this looks like, sounds like. And I'll just, at the end, I think I have my email address, but both for reach out to Melissa, reach out to me if you need some additional examples that are specific to a context, because even if I don't have them, we have a pretty quick network so we can get them fast. Okay, next one is the expectations being posted in the classroom. Oh, sorry, I just got distracted in chat. Yeah, having some professional development on why this is so critical, I think is one of those pieces. Some teachers might just do it because they don't, might not do it because they don't value or understand the importance of it. So reminding folks of the importance of it, I think is really critical. The other tie-in that I've often used for many of these things is teachers have often heard a lot about kind of trauma-informed practice or supporting kids who have higher levels of need all of these are consistent with those approaches. So positive, predictable, safe is kind of the mantra of all of these approaches. And these practices are ways to operationalize positive, predict predictable, and safe for kiddos. So the expectations in some of the schools that we have worked with in the past were posted in every non-classroom setting, but then you'd walk into classrooms and they were missing. So we wanted to just be really explicit that even though the school has these expectations, they still need to live and breathe in the classroom. And in schools that have those positive expectations, the classroom norms or expectations should be the same thing. That doesn't mean that teachers can't be nuanced in how they operationalize those. They can have their own classroom matrix. They should have their own classroom matrix. But the consistency in language becomes really helpful for everybody but especially kids who need more support. That consistency sets everyone up for success again, but especially the kids who need more predictability and safety. 
So some examples are that there's a poster that's visibly posted of the expectations in some classrooms, especially for younger students. I've seen either pictures of kids doing the expectations specific to different parts of the room. So how I'm safe when I'm putting my backpack away or how I'm responsible, again, whatever their expectations are, when I'm putting my materials away or how I access materials in a safe way. And oops, I did not mean to click there, going back. A non-example that I've also seen, which I think is done with really good intention, but the only place that's posted is the matrix, but the matrix is printed on an eight by 11 by the teacher's desk. And I would, I love the matrices. I teach them, I use them. I think they're fantastic, but I don't actually think they make really good posters. So even if it was on a full blown poster, that might be a helpful reminder. And for older kids, it might actually be sufficient, but for younger kids, it's a lot of words in a small space. So being able to really call people's attention to the expectations is probably done with fewer words than the matrix has. So again, kind of intentionally thinking about the function of the posting. And then the other non-example is obviously the educator who has things posted just as no stops and don'ts. And that is a tradition in many of our classrooms and it's a way many of us were raised. And so really helping folks to translate from, so if you don't wanna see this, what do you wanna see? I mean, these are the conversations we've had school-wide, but it's just asking them to have these conversations in their classrooms and with their kids and with their families. Yeah, negatively stated expectations can not only reinforce, but actually remind kids of the things that they don't, we don't want to necessarily see. I'm just checking the time to make sure. So that, this is a short story. One of my favorite kids at my school was, he was taught us so much. Um, he was a middle school kiddo and he had a pretty long history of being really aggressive. And he was the kid that all of our staff felt like couldn't respond because he tried to kill us in a few different ways, literally. Um, and so I met with him and I was like, I, we need to come up with a plan and some reinforcers that are going to work for you. And so he responded pretty appropriately in terms of his goals with, I want to get the F out of the school. I was like, awesome. I think getting back to a public school environment is a really good goal for you. So I was like, let's talk about what that's going to look like. And so we called the district and I was like, I need to understand specifically what the criteria are that you have for this student to be able to transition back. Because he also went on to say, like, if you put me on a short bus, I'm going to act like I ride on a short bus. I mean, which is fair, right? Like he was in a school that he felt like he didn't belong in. He wanted to get out and he felt like getting violent was one of his ways that he knew to get out. So we flipped it for him. We're like, let's work towards that. So the mistake we made, which was really stupid because I knew better, but the mistake we made was the district said, here are the three things that he cannot do if we want to admit him back in. So even though we were all positively stated in our, in our school-wide pieces, we wrote a contract with him based on those specific criteria. And I'm saying we, I think the teacher actually made the call, but I'm going to own it because I should have known better. So he was brilliant. Again, one of my favorite kids. So the three things were like punching. I mean, I think they could even accept a little bit of whatever. So it was like punching, kicking, and I can't remember what the third one was. So he didn't do any of those, not a one, but you can imagine he did everything else and he was so smart. So he also wouldn't do it himself most of the time, but he would get his peers to do it for each other, for him. So he like enlisted a couple of the kids to get them to do it. And I mean, I gave him huge credit for the brilliance, maybe not for the use of the skills he was using his brilliance on. But so a few weeks in, I was like, what the heck is going on? And I looked at the data and I looked at the contract and I was like, oh my God. So we flipped it back to our school aid expectations. And so we had a meeting with him and I was like, look, you are really smart and this is not going to actually work for you. So instead we're going to prioritize safety and here's all the ways safety looks and doesn't look. So that was a really long story to say. The negatively stated stuff not only prompts sometimes the inappropriate behaviors, but kids can follow the letter of the negatively stated law and still find loopholes. The positively stated, once we flipped it positive, he literally made it back to public school within a matter of months. So <clears throat> he pushed back a couple of times because 
you know, we all do. But once the expectations were really clear and once he trusted that we had a path for him to actually make it back, he made it back to public school in a self-contained classroom, made it out of a self-contained classroom, back into general ed, got himself fully out of special ed, onto sports teams. Like, and I'm not saying that was the only piece. Like there was a lot. His mom was amazing. There was a lot. But the flip from negative to positive was huge. So that's my very long story to just support the research on how critical it is for all kids. But he was a kid at the tip of our triangle in terms of level of need. And that small flip made a huge difference. Okay. So now that I'm pulling back from my story about him, <laughs> any other questions or observations about the expectations? You can tell I get really excited about this content. I could keep you all day and like for many days. So I'm going to make myself stop. Okay. Next thing is the physical arrangement. And just to be very clear, there is not one way that people should do things. So this is not trying to go in and establish a floor, floor plan for different classrooms. It is to say it should be thoughtful, right? So if I'm the educator, I'm thinking about how I teach, but also who I teach. So I'm thinking about how kids are going to move about the environment. If any kids have different mobility needs, I'm taking that into consideration. I'm thinking about the types of activities I do and how I want kids to engage. And I'm setting up classroom environments that match that. And I'm going to do that before I meet my kids. And then I'm going to watch them in my environment and fix it. So probably I'm going to get it wrong the first time I set it up. And probably I'm going to have to keep adjusting it throughout the year. So if I'm going in to look at a classroom, it's not like I'm saying, are the desks this perfect way? I'm going in and my question around physical envi environment or arrangement is, does it make sense? <laughs> like, is it actually setting kids and the educator up for success? And I will spare you the long version of the story, but just as a parent, when I've walked into classrooms and made assumptions about physical arrangement and then watched how the teacher used them even with my own kids, I have been struck by how important it is to understand not just what I see, but how they're using the space. So these critical features are one piece, but this to me has to be a conversation that is connected with, I think it's the next item, which is routines. So how I set up the space and then how I teach kids to use the space go hand in hand. So be a little bit cautious as you're rating this, to rate it in connection to how you're seeing kids and teachers move about and use the space effectively or not. There are also cases where you walk in and you can see really simple tweaks that would make this better. Making materials more accessible, making materials less accessible in certain cases, right? Making movement paths flow more easily through classrooms. So there's often simple tweaks we can make to help teachers be more effective with physical arrangement. So positive examples are the desks or whatever the seating spaces are, make sense for how the classroom is taught and how the kids are learning. The materials are labeled and clearly accessible where we want them to be. If we're in a science class with dangerous chemicals, not all materials should be accessible. So again, thoughtful use of those strategies. The non-example is things are a mess. There's not a rhyme or reason to how things are organized. If a student is trying to find something they can't because it's not labeled, it's messy, it's just a kind of a, a rough spot. So the physical arrangement I mentioned already has to go hand in hand with the routines. My super quick story is for my son when he was in first grade, I walked in and I thought it was going to be a train wreck of a year because the space looked chaotic. There was stuff hanging down. There was stuff at all different levels. It just was overwhelming to me. And on the back to school night, the teacher had the kids with a clipboard give parents a tour of their classroom. So I had seen it before school started. It was the same physical space. But through the tour, he walked me through every space. He told me what routines happened in that space. He told me how they used the materials. And so I'm sharing that because as the observer, I would have gone in and told the teacher, oh my gosh, this is too much. You need to edit down. And when he walked me through it, I walked away thinking, oh my gosh, this is brilliant. Like she has set everything up so intentionally. It all makes sense. It's connected to her routines. 
So like these two have to go hand in hand because there's not a right way to do the arrangement if you've taught it in a way that works for the kids. So the way to think about the routines is that kids are fluent with them. So we know we might not see the teacher teaching them, but we see evidence that they have been taught because the kids are fluent. The educator might be able to share with us how they taught them. They might have lesson plans. They might be able to describe how they've done it. You might also hear evidence that they have taught it because they've referenced. Remember how we enter the room. We enter, So you might see evidence of them having taught it even if you're not there when they teach it. So the routines are critical. The schedule being posted is part of it, but the routines go beyond just the schedule being posted, which is why those are two related but separate items. So again, some critical features of routines is that those things that we do over and over are predictable. So if there are, you know, entering the classroom, putting materials away, getting whatever, those are predictable. The procedures are clear. They've been taught where appropriate. Those are posted. We can see evidence they're practiced. We watch ed educators give specific feedback. And again, regardless of ability or age of students, we should see that kids can move through that environment and self-manage through that environment. So not in September, but as we get towards the end of the school year, we should start to see kids being independent with using and prompting these routines. And if I'm a kid who needs more prompting, maybe I have a personal prompt that helps me through some of that, that not all kids may need by the end of the school year. So examples, again, I've said most of these, that kids are moving independently, that the steps are clear. The non-examples would be you go in and kids seem really confused. Those routines that we know happen often, they don't seem predictable. The teacher's not referring to them. So it seems like every time it's kind of a new experience for kids. Again, if you think about the trauma literature, some of the other pieces that we talked about with schedules, it very much plays out in this conversation too. Positive, predictable, safe relies on having predictable routines. All right. So we mentioned earlier the importance of having expectations, having them posted. This item asks specifically to see evidence that they've been taught and even more than taught that they are prompted. So when we go in and work with teachers, prompting is the other skill we expect to see every time they teach. So teaching expectations, we might not always see if they've done it periodically throughout the year, we might not be there the time they're doing it but we should see evidence that they're prompting kids to follow the expected behaviors. So prompts are one of those skills that can be so effective. They set kids up for success. But when we go in and look at classrooms on average, just in your head, think about the number of prompts you would anticipate seeing in classrooms on average. Does everyone have a number in your head? So I will just share, so I don't have anyone kind of share and, and feel off. The average we see in research is zero, which is a really easy average to compute. What we see instead is that when I ask educators if they're using prompts, almost always what I hear is, I use these all the time. Are you kidding me? I teach little kids. I use these all the time. Are you kidding me? I teach science, like whatever it is. It's like, I always do this. But when we go in and look, they are providing redirections. So what they're doing is they're waiting for the kids to make the first mistake and then contingent on the mistake, they are providing a reminder of the behavior, but they've let the failure happen first. So the goal of the prompt is to catch it before it happens, right? It's to set the kids up for success before they have a chance to make a mistake. So one really easy way that we encourage folks to do this is positive greetings at the door. So if you are standing at the door welcoming kids into your environment, that is your first opportunity, whether it's in seventh period of high school or whether it's the beginning of the day in elementary school or whether it's after they come back from music, right? Like all of those are chances to be at the door welcoming them into the space. Even if you've walked them in a line, you still stand at the door, you welcome them into the space. And then as you're welcoming them, you're reminding them, hey, remember, we're going to be responsible and hey, today we're really focusing on being respectful. So here's what it looks like. So that prompt sets them up for success before they can make a mistake. So effective prompts happen before <laughs> they remind the behaviors and they're based on what we've taught in the past. So we don't rely just on the prompt to teach. It's that we've 
already taught and the prompt then calls up the instruction we've given. Thank you, Melissa. I love that you're sharing all the resources in chat. Um, so again, positive readings at the door is one way to do this, but we also ask teachers to think about as they're moving between routines in their instruction, each of those transitions is another opportunity to provide a prompt. And if you have a kid who makes lots of mistakes, they might need even more frequent reminders before they can make those mistakes. So in the study we're doing right now, this is another one of those strategies that we're talking about with teachers. You might remind all the kids three times. <laughs> you might need to remind this kid right before every opportunity you're gonna provide to respond, right? Like you might add a quick, hey, remember, before you do this for this kid to set them up for success. So we have examples of these in our slides. This is a little online intervention that we had done for some kids. So positive examples, the teacher reminds what's expected before having the kids do a small group activity. They remind them how to transition responsibly. The non-examples is the teachers who rely on error corrections to prompt. So again, error corrections, good thing, important part of instruction, but they should not be used instead of prompts. Because if we can prompt and pre-correct, we actually can reduce the error corrections. So we can get prompts, praise, and opportunities to respond to be really high, and we can start to see error corrections fall out because they become less necessary. Um, and again, for most of us, we have to prompt ourselves to prompt because it's not that we don't have good intentions around it. It's just that we're doing 37 other things. So thinking about how to set teachers up to remember to prompt. So this is our last quick activity. I know we're almost out of time, so I'm gonna do it really fast. So this teacher before beginning a lesson says, remember how to get my attention appropriately. And while they say that they're pointing to their raised hand, is that an effective prompt? Yeah, and I'm going fast. So it is because it's a verbal statement. It comes before it names the behavior. It actually modeled the behavior. So that one was perfect. So this is during the lesson, kid calls out and teacher responds. Instead of calling out, I'd like you to raise your hand to get my attention during a lesson. Yeah, so really effective error correction. They were specific. They reminded of the desired behavior, but it happened after the error already happened. So it was an error correction, not a prompt. Okay, last two. The next one is that not only do they have the specific feedback, but they have other consequence strategies built into their repertoire. So we had a list of other things to include or consider. The key thing is regardless of the other strategies, whether they have positive coupons for their school-wide piece, whether they're using a class-wide token economy, whether they have other approaches that they're using to respond to kids when they do make mistakes, they need to provide the feedback connected to those strategies. Because if you just get a coupon, it doesn't give the feedback. So the feedback is a critical component of any of those strategies. So teacher implementing classroom recognition system paired with positive feedback. Teacher thinking about an alternative behavior they want kids to use instead of the one they're currently using. So they reinforce hand raising to decrease talk outs. They reinforce kids engaging appropriately to decrease maybe other things the kids are doing instead of engaging. The non-example, <clears throat> this is the back of my son when he was in second grade. The non-example are strategies that yell at, humiliate, or publicly shame a kid. So there are lots of ways we can respond to behavior that set kids up for success. There are also some ways that do harm. And if we are using any of our strategies to respond to kids' behavior that publicly humiliate, shame, punish in ways that are aversive, students, we have gone wrong. <laughs> so clip charts and kind of the flip card systems, some people love them. I always say we do not blame tools, we blame implementation. So I have occasionally seen those tools used in a way that does not do harm and might even do a little bit of good occasionally. I have more often seen those tools used in ways that do pretty substantial harm. And one check for that is if you or a kid in class can guess 
where kids are going to be on that system. And especially if the kids they can guess happen to share some characteristics like being identified with a disability, being a kid of color, or the intersection of those two, sometimes throw in some gender, but often it's disability and race, we have gone wrong. <laughs> those systems have failed and we are doing harm in our classrooms. So thank you to Melissa for pop popping in the ditch the clip. While we don't usually blame tools, we have come out very clearly about this one. So be really thoughtful about the ways we're responding to behavior to set kids up for success and avoid doing harm. I will also say super quickly, and I know I'm out of time. If we are going into schools that are using these systems, we don't rip them out or ask folks to stop using them before we build up their skills with being successful in other ways. So when I'm working with educators, I never go in and say, this can't happen. I go in and say, let's talk about praise. Let's talk about getting opportunities to respond up. Let's talk about all of these other things. And once all these other things are fluent, you don't even want this or need it in your classroom because it's one extra thing. So just like we do with kids, we're building up replacement skills. We're building up the positive practices we want to see. And we will eventually start to rely less on the practices or the behaviors we don't want to see. So I'm going to not do this in any great depth, but the really quick answer to the where we learn more is there are so many resources out there. So do not feel like you're reinventing the wheel. The supporting and responding to kids social emotional behavioral needs is the practice guide I mentioned. There's a table with each bubble hyperlinked. Each bubble that's hyperlinked brings you to a table that describes the critical features, examples, non-examples, and resources for that practice. And there is a self-assessment tool connected to it. So if I'm working with a teacher, I would not hand this to them, but I might guide them through some of this work. So these are the practices. You can look at them in a lot more depth when you have more time. The companion guide is the same thing, but now thinking about school and leadership teams, school and district leadership teams supporting educators. There are features on the systems end and on the data end. You might notice the colors map onto the outcomes data systems practices graphic. For each of those features, there is a table that gives an operational definition, examples, non-examples, resources, and there is a self-assessment for teams to use and how they're supporting educators from a systems and data perspective. And again, you can dive into these in a lot more detail, but it's the other two bubbles of the practices. So I know we are out of time, so I want to be respectful and end two minutes late. Um, and I have a little bit of flexibility if folks have questions. I don't know if Melissa does, but I'm happy to hang out for a few minutes and to let us end the recorded part and let people go after the two hours and two minutes. So thank you for hanging in with me and hearing all the stories and sharing so many of your examples and resources. And please reach out with questions or comments. I realize my email address is not in this slide. I think it's it is in this one, I hope. It is not in this one. Melissa has it. Um, and you can also Google my name and UConn pays for it to be one of the first things that pops up. So you can find me really easily. So I'm going to be quiet. If you have questions or comments, please feel free to hang out, come off mute or use chat. And otherwise, have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you.